All right, time's up. I think we can start. We have um, 18 attendees who have joined us online and we have a total of 24, I think, because it's a Sunday evening, we'll have uh, several other viewers who will join us shortly. I want good evening, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Pick a Book, we warmly welcome you to the Flipside webinar series. Uh, we have those who are joining us live stream on Facebook, wherever you are at home, overseas, um, any part of the world, thank you for joining us here. Some of you are joining us for the very first time. We'd like to say hello to all of you. Uh, we understand this subject has been very close to you, and especially during this uh, pandemic time that we're going through. Uh, so a lot of you messaged me also and said that you'll be joining in today. Now, it's very warm in Colombo. If you are experiencing bad weather in other parts of Sri Lanka, uh, you do know that this has been recorded on Facebook and various other streams as well, so you can watch it later. Um, reading is the foundation for learning, uh, maximizing opportunities in life and advancing the pursuit of a well-balanced society. And pick a book encourages the reading habit by getting all the participants to select a book, read and research and run it through thoroughly and also share a summary to all the attendees, all those who are joining us here so that we like to encourage our community also to join us. Plus, it's not just about that. You're also joining uh, in terms of public speaking. You're in, in, you are improving yourself in these areas, communication, presentation skills, etc. And it's a complete package of wealth of knowledge. Our topic today is something that we can all relate to, something we can all use with some help, uh, how to surround yourself with the right people and influence others. A timely subject, which I would say, um, sometimes you find a lot of people who come with two different or three different facades, different roles that they play in different areas in life. You've got to select the right people to be in your life. Uh, some of them can be negative, some of them can be positive, some of them uh, can be um, hyperactive, you know, different kinds of people that we move on with our lives. We've got to manage and balance them as well. And how do we influence them to be a part of our life? We've got three fantastic panelists who will be sharing some great insights uh, from three books. You've already read the title, but I will do a brief introduction on those three books. I'm Sharon Maskrinias, and I'm going to be the moderator for this panel discussion. Joining us today as our first panelist is the Area Director for BNI Colombo Region, other lines of business covering software, data analytics, education, travel, and leisure. He's actively involved in a number of volunteer roles, charity organization that cares for the poor children as well as elders. He's passionate about impacting others through training programs, and mainly that is on motivational training. And he loves to travel, he loves to enjoy outdoors, and his goal is to bring travelers from around the world through his network to experience the beauty, splendor, and hospitality in Sri Lanka. He's the director, chief executive officer of Business Machines, and um, as a habit, as a moderator, I have this uh, thing where I ask every panelist what their favorite book is. And uh, this gentleman says that it's Robin Sharma being his favorite author and his book for the moment uh, top on the list is the 5 AM Club. Um, there's also a community which we will we'll tell you as we go along, but very honored to have an inspiring entrepreneur, Glenn Lord. Good evening, Glenn. Good evening, Sharon. Thank you very much and I go on to everyone. And uh, joining us next as our panelist, born, bred and still lives in Gaul, He's now a single, so if you, if you want to go on a holiday, contact him. Uh, he studied at Mind the College, decided to work in the field of human resource after completing the higher, higher studies on civil engineering. Loves to swim from childhood, and what he loves most is to argue. I'm going to learn some tips from you. Uh, a happy member of a PAB since almost its inception, but my, uh, his desire towards reading goes way past that. For the past few months during lockdown, he made him realize that he's good at one or two hobbies as well, such as cooking and writing. I think a lot of them have improved in this skill or area. As a result, he started writing his own blog, and congratulations on that. A reader and a blogger, Sachin Samagay, good to have you with us on this session. Thank you, Sharon, good to be here, thank you. 
Our next panelist is a key account manager at HC Need Mobile Solutions, where he helps businesses to grow and gain more profits. He is also helping tech and fashion startups to grow with his business in coaching sessions. He's a visiting lecturer at Informatics Institute of Technology, helping undergraduates to develop their skills and knowledge to get ready and face the industrial challenges. As a Toastmaster, he loves inspiring people and won the awards as international pub public speaking contests as well. As an international certified trainer, he enjoys training and helping people to achieve more. He also enjoys reading and is a happy member of the Pickaboo Office Club as well. His favorite book, The Secret by Rhonda Byron. Uh, reader and business coach, Ran Randula Vijay Singh, uh, good to have you with us as well. Right. Thank you, Sharon. And welcome all. Thank you for being here. So yeah, over to you. Um, so the three books that we're going to talk, Glenn is going to cover in the area of Who's in Your Room by Dr. Ivan Misner. Sachin Semage is going to cover Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. And Randula is going to cover How to Win Friends and Influence uh, People. These are the books that they're going to cover. We're going to quickly start with a quick roundup of, um, uh, we're going to start with Glenn and uh, the rest of the panelists. Can you give a quick brief view overview of the book. Let's start with Who's in Your Room, Glenn. Thanks, Sharon. And so Who's in Your Room is written by Dr. Ivan Meiser. It's actually co-authored with two other authors, Stuart Emery and Rick Sapio. Uh, talking about Dr. Ivan Meisner, as you know, he's uh, well known in the, in the world of uh, business networking. And he's put forward this book, a concept, which will actually help people in uh, living a life by their own design and also choosing the right people. Basically, this is what the book entails. And it's all about choosing the right people in your life. Sachin? All right. Uh, so uh, the Talking to Strangers is from the author called Malcolm Gladwell. He's, his latest uh, addition to his new book. And what he talks about is uh, how we miserab fail miserably when it comes to uh, new people, talking to new people and understanding how they behave. because all the abilities we have about identifying people and how they behave are with the people that we know. But when it comes to a stranger, we fail miserably. And the whole book is surrounded by different uh, examples of such cases. And he has theorized some of those. And yeah, that is basically the gist of the book. So on a weekly basis, how many strangers do you talk to? Oh, um, I like to talk to as much as possible, but uh, with the current situation, I think I should not tell the amount of people I talk. So yeah, <laughs> so right now, we, zero. Right now, zero. We like to ask a question from my attendees. How comfortable are you? And you can drop uh, your messages on the chat section um, as to how many strangers do you talk on a weekly basis? Randula, quick overview on the book, please. Yes. So. Uh... As Sharon mentioned, I'm going to share the insights from the book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. So this book, the specialty about the book is, is a almost 70 years old book, right? And it's uh, one of the hundreds most influential books. And even Warren Buffet already told, Carnegie changed his life. So it's a key business book and most businesses recommend the book to have. So overview as like key thing is, it, it helps you to influence people and to change the way of you thinking and make them feel how to do, like get things done. So all around that, how to get things done on inspiration. So that's the key overview of it. Right. So three inspiring books. Let's find out and see more in depth as to what uh, we're going to talk about uh, or what the book offers. Um, Glenn, uh, Dr. Ivan is known as the father of modern networking. Um, CNN uh, quotes him as that. How exactly is a person going to choose from um, the point where he comes into your room, as in our lives? What method, what criteria are we looking at? What is the author trying to convey to us as to who is in your room? Yeah, Sharon, uh, see, Dr. Ivan Meister being an expert in networking, as you've said, father of modern networking named by CNN. So obviously he's got a lot of tips that everyone can learn from about who should come into your life. So uh, the room that is referred to in, in this book is actually your life. And uh, this room, uh, the, author, uh, the author requests the reader to imagine their life in one room 
with one door and this is an entry only door there is no exit so therefore anyone who enters your room cannot move out so this is what it means whoever comes into your room or your life never leaves it so this concept actually opens up to simple ways towards living a better life uh, surrounding yourself with supportive people uh, probably um, i would also say living your life by your own design not living according to someone else's design and also uh, living the life that you desire to the fullest so this is roughly what they what dr ivan meisner is putting forward in the concept to the readers right um and i asked the question as to uh, how many strangers is everyone comfortable uh here are a few comments uh, that i quickly like to take through very few people 100% comfortable with strangers with arms length i agree with you uh, who, who was that okay it's a pickable guess and as well as uh, four okay vasantha dai says four we like to hear from the rest of the attendees as well uh coming to the stranger uh sachin we meet strangers on a daily basis and i think it's pretty rough now when there is social media um uh, quickly people google for the person they identify they get their whole bio if they want to check on the person how good are we when it comes to judging and detecting a person first you know the 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 appearance when you see that person if you meet that person live but if it's off online then it's completely different how do how do we judge okay uh, in sim simple terms um, i would like to say terrible and the book argues a lot on this and ma mainly um, as glen said and uh, even even sharon said we can say four that is we are comfortable with but we can say a different specific number but at the end of the day with the world coming together it is we are more forced to work with strangers than the people that we know so because of that this is something very important and that is the same reason why malcolm picked that topic in particular so why i say terrible when we when we comes to um, judging people as soon as we meet them uh, in his book the other book which was discussed last week i guess spokes about how people get a perception on a person as soon as they see another one so but it doesn't talk about how accurate that would be and there are a bunch of research and uh, i will not going to uh, talk about all the researches that have happened on this but bunch of research that have happened uh, suggest that we are terrible terrible absolutely terrible at judging people on on daily basis and uh, if i am to give you some examples if you keep some judges who who are supposed to judge strangers and if we are given with 100 people and 50 of them say, tell a lie and 50 50 of them tell another maybe maybe a truth your accuracy even judges or even very uh, seasoned fbi agents would only get about 52 to 54% accuracy that is like flipping a coin you can even just flip a coin and tell who is telling a lie and who is telling the truth so if you think i mean all the uh, even whoever joined here if you think that you are good at maybe judging people well sorry to break your bubble actually the truth is 100% 99% sure that you are not and i will tell you about the small fraction that are uh, maybe good at this but actually in the in, in the long run about the majority talking about this is the same scene and to give you a basic very quick example um we we believe that we need to vote new people to the parliament we believe that we need to bring new phases and we we are fed up with the current system or whatever but as soon as they ch quickly change their propaganda or quickly change how they how they uh, do their marketing we start to believe okay maybe maybe they are talking talking the truth and uh, that is something that is a phenomena that uh, he he describes in his book as defaulting to truth so as a human being we always default to truth whatever we say whoever we talk we first think that person is telling truth unless we get an overwhelming amount of evidence to convince you otherwise so we we meet uh, ch cheating partners all the time and as soon as they tell the slightest lie we believe okay maybe that is true so that is the reason uh, i'm not saying that is wrong there is a flip side to it as well but on the on the on the on the other on the other hand we believe that uh, people tell truth 
all the time. And that is what he's talking as uh, defaulting to truth. Yeah. I think uh, Sri Lankans are generally uh, very open about it. They're very honest in their opinions with what they say. It's just that uh, it, it turns into a little bit of a joke uh, sometimes if they want to put out a message out there. Uh, so yeah, as you said, terrible at judging people. And then there can be um, a different understanding through different people with the way you talk, the tone you talk, the vibe you give, the negativity that rolls in. All of these questions uh, come in when you talk to a stranger and they say the first impression where you introduce yourself with that confidence, the poise and all of that. And it's simple. It's just like going in for an interview. And if that person is not strong enough, not a strong candidate, then, then everything goes down. All right, complete stranger from talking to a stranger. We are going to go into how to win friends and influence people. I think that's a very simple strategy, isn't it? Put on a smile and, you know, talk to everyone around. And then you bring the, be the winner of the conversations, win the spotlight. Randall, is that how it works? Or what's the biggest secret when it comes to dealing with people? Right. Thank you, Sharon. So as you mentioned, yes, it's all, it's very simple. It's all in our back of our mind. But thing is how to realize it and how to act upon that. So the biggest secret, there are two things I want to highlight uh, where Dale Carnegie shared, is number one, most of the time when we are dealing with people, what do you think the key challenge of uh, when you're dealing with people? And 80% of the time we spend on that, right? So the key challenge is, which I also realized after reading it, is to get things done from that particular person. So can be with friends, can be with family, can be at work. And most of the time, we 80% of the time, the, what the author says is, when we are dealing with people, we always want to get things done and uh, to communicate to get things done. But how to do it effectively? That's where the uh, author talks about. And what do, you, what do you think, how to get it uh, more efficient? What do you think the most effective way to get things done? We are forcing. We are trying to negotiate. We are trying to convince the people, convince the person. But what highlighted by the author is actually, it means you want to make that person like feel to do it, like want to do that. I'll give you an example where the book says as well is when you, most of us know fishing and most of us go fishing as well, right? When we go fishing to, um, when you go fishing basically, even though you like strawberries or pizza and all, but you just put, uh, you just hook a worm or like a grasshopper or some sort of insect to do fishing, to lure the, lure, lure the fish uh, towards, your, towards the hook, right? You don't use strawberries or pizza to do that. Even though you like it, you just use what that fish wanted to do, right? It actually makes me kind of uh, resonate again Come on, we are using it and we are not using for people. So you want to make them motivate to do it for yourself. Example, another example I want to highlight, it's an interesting story. We, I believe most of us also experience it at home is when you have a small kid. So the book says there's a small kid that uh, he, he actually like protests to go to the kindergarten, right? And like can't, he actually said, I'm not going. So what the father and mother did was just write it, just wrote it down basically what that, that child would like to do. Uh, not going to clean the garden, but as generally what children like. Can be like finger paints, eat something likewise. So they picked finger painting and all, at that night, they all got together and started finger painting, right? Then the small kid slowly came in and asked, can I do that? So what parents told was, you have to, it actually, we learn it from kindergarten. So you have to go to kindergarten to learn it. And that's where the next day, actually, without any forcing, the small one is ready to go to the kindergarten, right? So you have to get it very subtly to get things done. So the other part that I want to highlight is, okay, you started it, you triggered that the person want to do it, make like pick the motivation part to do it and start it, how to sustain it. And that's where the author, the author highlights is it's by the appreciation. When was, I want to ask a question or with the audience as well. When was the last time you appreciate your, your friend, wife, husband, or colleagues, right? We are very much lack on like main sincere appreciation. So you'll start appreciating people to get things done as well as to sustain it. 
where final example the story is very interesting about to highlight is uh, stan actually is a supervisor at a janitorial service and right? he's handling janitors and there's a very bad performing janitor at that uh, service who had a lot of complaints but when he actually went and observed that person he saw like one or two positive things of that person and he tried to emphasize that positive in front of everyone i'm going to highlight in front of everyone because we used to complain a person or like uh, criticize person in front of everyone but we are very low on appreciating people in front of everyone so what he did was appreciating that person in front of everyone and day by day he actually got better he did very well and end of the day he was performing as average a uh, janitor it's a true story that book highlights so you have to do simple things you want to talk in terms of that person motivate as well as appreciate that person to kind of sustain it so those are the two secrets that you want to deal with people if you want to get things done effectively over to you randula thank you for bringing us a very important point i think a lot of people do appreciate it's the way they say it uh, for example just a thank you that's it and uh, what what uh, what i see with a lot of people is that some people expect you for a feedback did you like it the the way you respond to it and sometimes the thank you that you said can be easily forgotten over two weeks time and that's where i'm going to come back to glen to ask the person who comes into your life uh, might might make like a solid foundation start things up be your best friend and then like a blink of an eye everything disappears and then all that's left is memories this appreciation of saying thank you is forgotten and then you wonder what's the value of this person how how does uh my snow explain about this glen yeah so see coming back to uh, it's about getting who is going to come into your life is what we are talking about from the book who is in your room So what Dr. Ivan Meister says is it's all about training your doorman to identify who's walking into your room. Right now, our rooms are all wide open, and this is how uh, everyone that is in our room has entered our room with our doors wide open. Our doorman has not been doing his work. So the doorman in your room that Dr. Ivan Meister relates to is your heart and your mind, and you have to train your heart and your mind. about whom to let into your room so all these days you've got a whole lot of people who have let into your, you have let into your room there are some people you cannot let out of your room or you had no choice family you have no choice relatives you have no choice they all come into your room so coming back to your question you might have someone in your room who actually lets you down uh yes there is a criteria on how you handle those people but before that i'd like to tell you about how to how to control the people who are coming into your room is by actually determining determining your values uh values as in very very comparable to core values of a company you see core values of a company big as ever on a wall for everyone to see but in our homes we have no core values we are not proud of any values to put on a wall we are not we are not proud to talk to anyone about our values or probably we've not even thought about the core values in our family so i think to a certain extent you can you can control and uh, probably let in the right people into your life if you have a set of core values uh, one of these things is that you can link your core values to various things to your professional life to your parenting values uh, social values family values so your core values can be broken up into so many other areas uh, dr ivan meister talks of a very good example of uh, an 18 year old girl known to a family friend who had got actually involved with uh, uh, someone whom she didn't really know and they they found out finally that he was a drug dealer and uh, this pretty daughter of theirs was totally involved and could not get out of it very soon they found uh, lots of things missing from the home and uh, they even found money being getting lost so they decided to consult one of these authors rick stapio who is one of the co-authors and he did tell them about this value system so they set up some values family values and they started talking to their daughter about these are the values that our family will live by sooner or later 6 8 months down the line she comes back and says dad mom i've left this guy 
And they were quite surprised because they thought it would never happen. And then they asked her, how come you did this? Well, I put forward my values and I just noticed that he didn't fall in line with, with my values. So I thought uh, this is not the way to go. And this is how I managed to sort getting rid of that issue. And uh, so she gave up, she gave up this relationship. So it's always important to understand that uh, your life is a reflection of the five or six people that you keep in close contact with, whether you like it or not. Think about it, something for even the viewers to dwell on. Your life is a reflection of the five or six people that you keep in close contact with. So coming back to your first question is, you have all these people, yes. It's now time to understand who are the people who bring happiness into your life? Who are the people who bring sadness or unhappiness into your life? And that's one of the things that is taught in the book on how to assess these two people and how to train your domain from this point onwards. Wow, uh, it's interesting uh, to see the comments that we're getting, which we will take uh, once we cover up uh, with the uh, sessions that we have with the rest of the panelists as well. I'm gonna move on to Sachin now to ask you, uh, can we tell how a person feels from the way they behave. Um, now, let's say a stranger walks into their life. Now, I'm a girl, and when a stranger walks into me, I'm a bit, I mean, you you have your little PR skills of saying hello, hi, and that's it. Uh, but the messages, the tone that we share can be a little, mis they might have a misunderstanding that we are provoking them into something else, whereas we're just being absolutely business professional, Hello, hi, that's it. There's nothing beyond. How do we see this, that people get a wrong misunderstanding or a message? Okay, um, that depends. So to uh, make you understand, can I ask you a question? So um, are you familiar with the TV series, the most famous TV series, Friends? Yeah. Okay, so um, the episode where um, Ross finds out that um, Chandler and Monica are dating each other mm -hmm. that if you can remember that particular scene where Ross comes into the room and then he jumps on to Chandler and then jump uh, Chandler tries to hide and then everybody else comes into the room so it's a it's a whole gamut of drama there so if you I mean I try this uh, try to do this uh, by yourself also um, if if you mute actually if you mute the audio and try to watch it you can absolutely understand every bit of it even without hearing the audio so you can say that Friends or any TV series in as per se is very mismatched. Sorry, is is very matched. As an ex, uh, what you mean? If when when uh, Ross looks perplexed, he is looks like a person in a stereotypical way in a per perplexed person. And when when Chandler looks scared, he looks scared. He, he his eyes widened and he looks scared. But in reality, what Malcolm Gladwell discusses is that people are not like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are a presenter, so you must have seen that whenever you start with, uh, with, a, with, a, with an interview or maybe when uh, addressing a large gathering, there are people who are very engaging, who shake their head, who are very engaged and laugh at your jokes. And there are some people who are like, yeah, whatever. So, but most of the time as as a presenter you would lock on to that particular person and try to get them engaged but it won't work right so the main reason that happens is they must be enthusiastic about the same thing as the other person who is very dramatic about it but the the expressions that they show to the other side or to the other people who are looking at them are different so the way they behave and the way they put themselves out is mismatched so most of the people we we live past, or most of the strangers that we understand uh, that they, that we uh, encounter, are mismatched in some aspect of their life. So when we think that they are angered, or maybe when we think that they are not interested in what we talk, maybe that's not the case. Maybe they are mismatched, and that is why they think like that. So if I am to uh, bring you some uncomfortable memory about uh, the, the murder of the uh, child called Seya Sadevmini, if you remember uh, uh, quite back, as soon as that murder happens, everybody, I think even, even I suspected that father has to do something with it 
because father was very normal about it and he was like uh, yeah i saw her, i saw her in the morning and then she got lost and she, he's not crying he he doesn't look like stress is emotions yes the emotions are not reflected by how he feels and we thought that maybe because of that he must have done it and that's why he doesn't feel any emotions but end of the day happened to be completely wrong so that is how that that is a typical sri lankan scenario of a mismatch and and we we encounter a lot of such things and we think that we are very good at judging people but most of the cases some of the people are mismatched and we think that uh, that that is the case and uh, going about back to uh, us we all wonder why we, why trump won that election but we think that trump is way too much out there and he talks and he tweets at 1 am in the morning after watching a tv series or even after watching news he tweets and whatever he think and we are like does he ha- even have a media uh, personnel who is looking after that and we, it's it's very confusing how he won the election in the first place but what uh, even malcolm gladwell argues is that by his openness about how he behave and and like he doesn't have a have a barrier about his behavior and how he puts it out so he's a very matched person when he is angry he he blame it out on 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 someone they blame it out on china so because of that he he is very matched and that reflected as a result of uh, maybe what you call an openness and people feel like he is being very open and he won't cheat us like the other um, uh, politicians so that is that, that was his pitch and it worked out in his favor so a mismatch and uh, but i'm not saying that his behavior is acceptable or not that is up to debate but that is what uh, malcolm gladwell argues in his uh, talks as well that some people are matched where we can understand them and uh, by the behavior and how they talk but the other people are not they are mismatched they will uh, they will tell a lie and they will look very convincing and i saw uh, some um, question as well where people when when people ask uh, questions and when people when the strangers are uh, lying to you how can you detect it mm. well the 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 sad story is it's very difficult to do that because uh, if you are a good actor or if you are a mismatch then of course you will be perceived in a wrong way so that is something you have to understand and live with and uh, make sure that you know that aspect in your life where you cannot jump into conclusions as soon as you so a peep so a person because they might be mismatched and i think it's also important such in that people are not instantly open to tell all that they know to a complete stranger um you have to be careful with the contents about yourself or what you share uh because i mean it's your life that you need to protect and it's not just you it's your family your friends all of these people um uh, which also comes to my next question to randula now um uh, people carry many facades you know when they go to work it's one person when they uh, when they come home with their families there there's someone else uh and sometimes i'm just bringing a very very vague example the wife might tell um my husband is the coolest guy at home and then this is the same guy in office who is fussy moody angry you bring it on don't talk about finances when you wake up in the morning it's different different sides of people but then how do we make this one person to be loved or liked instantly as soon as we you know meet them how how does that work randula right so Uh, it, it, it's an interesting question, actually. So I want to bring from Sachin's uh, conversation. You're starting a conversation, right? You want you are with all strangers. You want to start the conversation. So we all, on your the wording, the utterance. What I heard was how to make him listen to you, right? Isn't that the key thing? How to make him listen what you're talking? And the irony and the key part that Dale kind of get highlights is you start listening first. you should listen first actually to make that person uh, feel it uh, make that person utter it so first thing you have to ask yourself is am i attentively listening to that person or what i am like um, am i trying to talk because most of us 
when you are having a conversation or so how to like be a good conversation this is we always try to talk and talk and i like, ask follow up questions we are not listening we are always try to hear that what person utters and then try on my on on the mind you are trying to ask another question you are just like uh, formatting the next question you're going to ask it's not the case what author highlights is you have to first do a big listen, like spend a lot of time on listening and you can ask just one or two questions based on the context it's not what you want to get it first let them speak listen it first right so interesting uh, story is uh, this will for many businesses this is very important handling customer complaints we also has done complaints and how to handle customer complaints effectively is uh, one story which is a, a big uh, pizza company and this person already started uh, like uh, blaming all over and there was no uh, like a customer success person handling this and there's a one person actually went on and what he only did was listen to that person whole two hour time whole two hours he just listened what are the issues and all just ask one or two questions and end of the day he actually uh, removed his complaint and he was totally okay with it and he said i'm going to order again and you are a, just a great conversation so what the subtle secret of it is just listen to that person because to make it attentive and another part uh, which is also interesting at the at home what we want to highlight is uh, there's this lady and a small kid uh, and he actually came in to came into her and told mom i think you love me so much and mom was like so surprised and asked yeah obviously i i love you so much and uh, what do you call you're my son right no mom you, i i know you love me so much because when i talk to you you just keep all things aside and listen to me and that's where the small kid has identified his mom like him so much and love him so much so it's basically the listening and the other part is how to continue that is you always make them as i mentioned to you earlier appreciation you try to admire them just out of any other thing you don't expect anything return you just admire what that uh, you, you think about that person or feel or saw like example dale carnegie was at the queue at a uh, like a uh, post office at that stage it's 1948 uh, so but he was uh, when when he was uh, when he was there actually he saw this uh, clock always stamping and it's a very boring job we all we all think it's a boring job and he actually uh, when he got his chance he actually saw and he identified that the key thing about that person actually is what 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 are the things i can admire him how can i make him feel good is he actually appreciated his hair admired him i uh, he just told i i think i wish i had a hair like you and that person was so stunned and looked at him for like 2 minutes because nobody is going to tell like that nobody is going to admire because we always think about return what what it is what in it for us so what all the says is listen as well as start, start to admire people without no reason so it's it's the key thing to make you like randula um i'm going to ask you as a continuity now okay what's in it for me i have to be a good listener um isn't trust like your number one thing because once you meet someone you want to instantly like that person and then uh we have the habit of having this very confident conversation and then you build that little trust and then one lie is enough that everything just goes for a six but how do you win that trust with this person that you just met how 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 do you see it according to uh the author yeah so what other says is even from the listening part that trust actually comes in because you start trusting that person only when that person listens or do you do even start uh, what do you think you do even like that person because you have to make the first impression to uh, trust that right trust that person so how do i know that person we trust if you recall or if you just do this exercise tomorrow and see whether if you listen to that person if someone is listening to me i feel that person is trusted or like building that trust Yes afterwards you have to from your wording from your like all the aspects you have to build the trust but the first thing is you have to pay attention you have to listen even husband and wife or your friends or your colleagues most of the cases what we feel is we, we are not listening because we are on the other world we just want to focus get it done that's done 
So first thing, trust is you just start listening to that person and make him feel that you're trust. That, that's the start of that. Then you can continue. So how to start it, how to kick off is that start listening. You have to talk. There's a, even a question comes up. You have to talk, yes. But talk in terms of that person. What is he asking? Like ask about uh, where even a conversation, I believe Sachin would agree with me. Even a conversation, you build a conversation from that asking about the persons about them, not about telling about you. Because boasting about you or telling about you will not work. It's always ask about that person. You start it. So you build the bridge and then you can continue. So building the bridge uh, part is that uh, what uh, the author says. Something that came to my mind was uh, the lecturers today keep talking about themselves a lot. And <laughs> then <laughs> there exactly. is no lesson that goes on. The kids come yeah. back and tell you, I think I, I know more about my lecture, but I don't know much about the lesson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so but questions, I, I think questions should be the one that you should listen to the students first. You ask questions. So I all right. believe that. Yeah, true. Yes. Uh, uh, we're going to go to Glenn now and while we thank all our attendees for joining us in, thank you uh, for being with us. We're talking about uh, who's in your room, talking to strangers, as well as how to win friends and influence people. These are the three uh, primary books that we're talking about. Uh, Glenn, you mentioned that the concept is what whoever comes into your life will never leave. But often, many of us who have had some bad experiences vow not to have anything to do with that person, arm's length distance. And isn't there some kind of confusion here? Because uh, something happens and then you feel, I'm going to cut this person out of my life. Uh, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing that a lot of people do. And then it's, it's very embarrassing sometimes when you meet at a public gathering, you just want to... <laughs> You know, how, how do we gain some tips for uh, this little insight? Yeah, so uh, Sharad, I think you, you already answered your question in a certain way. So before, before reading this book, I think for everyone, right? We always think, you know, that guy hurt me. He let me down. I have nothing to do with him. He's off my list. I've scratched him out. He's not in my life. And you think everything is tickety-boo, like you said, you walk into some place and you see this guy and you are fuming. So what does that actually mean? Those people are never out of your life. The fact that you're getting angry with them, the fact that you're getting upset again, the emotions that you're getting while seeing this person again, whom you thought was out of your life, they are actually in your life. So the next, see what happens is when you tell this to people, then they say, Okay, then what is your concept all about? What is this concept all about? Then how do you deal with these people? So uh, the Who's in Your Room uh, book gives you a fantastic way of doing this. So it talks about the book racks behind in your room. So you have to imagine that you have a book rack behind your room and you have a lot of empty corrugated cartons with a lot of tape stacked on the side. So what do you do with such people? You pack them into the box, tape them in the box and put them in the shelf. Just keep checking them on and off throughout uh, your, your lifetime or your life journey, see if they're behaving a little better so that you can let them out of the box. So basically you send these people into the background and you get other people into the foreground. Uh, you get people who actually believe in you, people who like to see you succeed, uh, not people who actually let you down, people who walk with you, who are ready to even cry with you when you are, when you are sad, lift you up. And uh, those are the people that would actually be in the foreground in your life. So all the people you have nothing to do with or you think you have nothing to do with, they are the ones you've got to box up and keep it in the rear. It's not that you're losing them forever. If there is a chance for you to forgive, bring them back, of course, bring them back into your life, that's fine. But the fact remains, every person who enters your life will never, never, never leave. The more and more I, I read this book, I've read this book about five times now because it's so, it's, it's so fascinating to me and it has changed my life. I know quite a lot of people I've spoken to about the book have come and told me, you know, I took off a whole lot of friends from my friend list. <laughs> I felt very bad. I thought, oh my gosh, what have I got down to this guy? So, but this is, this again is the way that it uh, projects. Uh, and it's again all about uh, coming back to who you're going to bring in is all about the values. And I think uh, Sachin and uh, Randula both uh, talk about how to set up values, you know, 
Uh, it's about handling people. So they're they they talking a lot about the context of who is in your room also in getting certain values of people coming in. Yeah, so it's not a confusing message. It may be confusing at this time, but remember everyone who comes in never leaves your life. Um, Glenn, in the Big Bang Theory, Sheldon Cooper has a list of friends. Do you have a list too? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to take this off. Sorry. <laughs> this is um, this topic for another time, I think. Yeah, we have a big list of friends. I, I, I mean, all of us, right? We have different phases of life. And you will all see at a certain time, your life changes drastically. Super things start, start happening. You start doing new things that you've never done before. What does that, that signals actually... Uh, the, the, the friends who have come into your life at certain phases have been the spark that have actually got you to go that someone sees you, for example, someone sees you the way you present Sharon and says, Sharon, you can do this. We want you to come to our show. Uh, you want, we want you to uh, host this show and you do it for year on year. You, you sign up contracts with people. Now, these are the changes that come in through certain friends who come and they like to share our, our, our success. They like to see us succeeding. So my friends, they, I love all my friends. Uh, please don't get me wrong when I talk about this concept. I love all of them. My childhood friends are closest to me. Uh, but there are sometimes, um, I have to confess I was a party animal. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I would party. I would go and to work with I, burning. I think that's all right. I think that's that okay. one time in my life. I still party, but I cannot party the same way I did it maybe 20 years ago. I couldn't do that. And uh, so right now, partying is not the focus. But there is this other set of people who have actually come in and helped me to grow, develop myself in a different way. Uh, like you said, nothing wrong in party. I, I do love a good party one, one, once in a way. But again, it's all the different set of people that come in and... Uh, they change your life overall. So I think you need to look out for those people and bring them into your life and actually open the door for such people. And I think uh, over a period of time, Glenn, a lot of people mature and then you realize you need to instill values on other people and you need to set an example, encourage the youth, be a part of it. And that's what Pick a Book is also what they do here. We love to encourage people to read books and there is so much of value and wisdom that we can gain from a book. And also with based on today's conversation that we're speaking of trust, we're speaking on mismatch, determination, people who walk into our lives, how do we manage them, et cetera. And uh, we're gonna now talk to a stranger's uh, a subject that we are, that most of them, and I can see a lot of comments coming in. I want to know if I can reconstitute the friendship with a person like that. Uh, Faraz, we'll take your question soon. But before that, I want to ask, um, Sachin, after years of evolution, why are we still so primitive at this? Why are we, why are we like that? Okay, so uh, before getting on to that question, uh, just about minutes ago, before we start this session, uh, actually Glenn sent me a friend request on Facebook. So thank you for letting me in for your room. Uh, <laughs> So moving back to the question, um, it's, it's, it's pretty basic if you think about it, but uh, from years of evolution, we think that like we are so advanced in terms of our life being. So we got rid of all the other human types and we, the homo sapiens are the current trend, if I may say, because we are so good at evolution. But on the contrary, uh, we think that because of this, we should be good at judging people and we should be good at um, understanding people because that is a part of the evolution. But when you think about it the other way, it's actually not true. Because if Sharon, asks, Sharon keeps uh, questioning or anybody else keeps questioning every single thing I say right now, would even this conversation works? No, right? So... Um, to anything, the first thing that, uh, I mean, humans are habitual animals. So in order to create an organization, in order to even converse between two people, you need to trust that other person. So that is the basic instinct 
that we have created over the years and years of time. And on the other hand, who would love to live with a primitive, uh, with, a, with a super paranoid person? Have you ever seen a person say, oh, I love uh, the way she's paranoid about everything and that that's why I'm going to marry her. Or I love how he questions everything in his life and that's why I'm going to marry him. I come across him. people like that. <laughs> okay. Weird world, but... Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, basically you don't like people who are super paranoid. I mean, maybe you like for them to be CIA agents, but you don't like to live with them, right? So what does that tell you? That gene won't go to the other, uh, other layer of the gene because people would not like to uh, mate in a primitive manner with the people who are paranoid. So because of those, those two reasons, we have been filtering all the paranoid people throughout our life, throughout generations, thousands of years. And because of that, currently we are in a state where we are forced to trust people. And Malcolm particularly talks about this. I mean, yes, we are bad at beside, uh, working with strangers, but that is not a bad thing. That is, a, that is some, some payment that we have to do in order to maybe, maybe to have a better future. Because uh, as, as much as we trust people, on the other side of the story, we might get deceived sometimes, but we can't move on with, uh, with life without trusting people. So be careful on, on, on understanding this. Even Glenn said the, the, Glenn the, say, said the same thing. Um, yes, you, can, you, you need to have friends, but sometimes you need to filter them out and have a few people. But on the core value, the basic understanding is you need to have some people in your room. You can't, you cannot have not pe no people in your room. You need to have some people in your room. And you need to be specific about it. But right. uh, what I'm talking is maybe we are a bit uh, but uh, on on on, a, on the contrary, that is basically the idea. So it is a, it is a price to pay, but it is uh, it is a price that we must all pay in order to uh, pursue in our future. Sachin, there is also questions asked by strangers. Now, I walk into a public gathering. Sorry, I'm bringing examples here, and then people would you know strangely pop in a question and ask, "Have you got a boyfriend?" Are you married? Are you single? Don't you think these questions that you ask from a complete stranger would sometimes be overpowering? It's, it's like you don't even know this person. You met this person for the very first time. And how can you ask? So sometimes the questions that you ask also have to be uh, in, in such a way that it's not... Um, um, it, I mean, it's all to do with their personal life. If you want to connect with the person, it makes an understanding. But I'm, I'm, I went into a very bit of a uh, joking conversation there, bringing you insights on a uh, general question. But sometimes the questions that people ask or how they build their conversation is also a little, uh, I would say, um, you need to be careful, isn't it, with what you ask and the tone you ask. Yes. Uh, so basically what happens uh, when most of people is they don't actually pay attention about how others would perceive you, but instead they will try to show some, uh, some image that they would like to think that they have. But most of the cases, because of this situation of mismatching or because you are trying to show some, some personality which you are not, on, on because of that reasons, uh, the way you are trying to put things out might not uh, reflected on the same way that is, that is supposed to be. On If I am to take the same example that you came up with. So um, there could be different reasons why people ask such questions. Some pretty obvious reasons where uh, they are very interested about a girl or maybe they are, they are trying to flirt or whatever. But on the other hand, maybe that person also might be trying to talk to you or maybe actually uh, create a conversation, but in a wrong way. I mean, Absolutely. who would straight away go to a person and ask if they are married or whatever as a first question? 
right that is the stereotypical way that we think about the world and uh, in 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 the real scenario that person must be thinking about i mean that person must be super genuine about his intentions his or her mm. intentions mm. so that person might be just interested about your life and genuinely wants to know a little bit about you but what happens on the on on the background is you have met people maybe you have met so much of perverts uh, 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 forgive my language uh sell, asking the same questions with the wrong intentions that you think that person is also on that category what actually happens is that person might have been mismatched so every yeah. time when someone approaches you always try to give the benefit of the doubt always keep the distance also but try to give the benefit of the doubt because maybe that person is mismatched maybe that person uh, is trying to actually genuinely have trying to may, uh, have a conversation so there is a there is a pretty of pretty much of a judgment call there which which you have to come with the experience but uh, on the other hand uh, as much as experience we are we are only experienced from the from the past that we have and first time you meet a mismatched person you might get it all wrong so you need there is a risk on it always but the most important factor is you need to know that there is a risk of you being wrong instead of that other person being wrong the all all the time so it's not to be too friendly and not to be too cold as well uh, in most exactly. cases you be diplomatic in the way you handle uh, people or strangers that you meet. Uh Randula I'm going to move on to you now. Um so listen and always don't look for something but a lot of people will look at the point where uh what am I going to get when I give a gift? Uh that's the kind of thing that a lot of people look at. If you don't do this, you will be moving into a trouble system like this. How do you see this as an explanation in the book? right so i think it's a interesting way that you brought out how uh, which the conversation and uh, on the conversation part as well as the uh, to make it listen as well as how to get things going how to encourage the people to talk in terms of what they talk so one thing is even when you are starting a conversation key thing is to talk in terms of the interest of that person that the book says or the deal kangi says is not the full conversation but you should start with that which is the trust as well as the interest that person want to talk to you because we always have our own mind okay am i interested on this and um, back of my mind even though how interesting that person or how like can be a pretty can be pretty can be like you want to talk to that person in, in in terms of sales you want to get that person and talk to the ceo or cfo likewise but main thing is you need to talk in terms of that person's interest first to get in that's the basic thing and the other part which the book highlights which you have highlighted also is what is uh, the key thing if you don't do it what you'll miss right let me ask a question from you and as well as our valuable attendees as well what is the most sweetest and like um, most important sound in any language for to you what is the most sweetest and most important sound in any language to you sound sound which specific i'll tell sound hmm. any guesses glen glen sachin i think no. everybody is passing the ball to glen <laughs> <laughs> right it's none other than sound or word yeah can be a word can be sound sound of silence, sound of silence. smile i was going to say love. joy so love when you okay vasant so when you uh, when you say love it, it's the most interesting part okay interesting any any other thoughts any other comment uh, maybe maybe yeah. laugh there Sorry. is laughter Laughing. caring and loving sound caring and loving i think is laughter sound of laughter in any language is real happiness right it brings and it I can be misunderstood but being a more it, powerful it, it's, it's like yeah. yeah get it personal also a bit get it personal also a bit what do you like when someone talks to you what is the most interesting and the most important thing when person talks to you can be I one word can be two words the powerful okay. energy 
or the happiness that comes through from one person sharing their positivity to another person. I'm sorry, I elaborated, but no, 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 no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. I would no, say okay. I would say anyone would like to know how much people care for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And we see a couple uh, uh, comments coming from tone, softness, calling your name. Yeah, I hate it when people John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. I think uh, we are coming near to that. Right. Okay. So let me share. When even yeah. when I when I'm reading the book, I'm going through the book pause. I was resonating, and it was very like there's a lengthy paragraph, and that's where the answer was. It's none other than your name. It is the most sweetest and most important word in any language to you. That's why I told it's personal. Take it personal. If anyone call you, okay, Sharon, Glenn, Sachin. It's the key thing and can be, uh, like say, Vasanta and all. So who are the attendees? That person calls the name. But again, you will, you will get your first impression very positive. That's what the book says. Very positive, strong impression. But the key thing and also the misconception and where you'll go wrong is if you spell it incorrectly. If someone calls you Sher, Sharon, what's your name, Sher? Suddenly, what, what do you feel? What do you feel? I'm of course right? honestly yeah, very yeah. very awesome. chilled about it, but uh, <laughs> someone, if someone calls me baby, I'm very offensive. <laughs> <laughs> right. So even you misspell. There are some names that say it's very hard to spell as well. But you should take the effort or time if you really value that person. If you want to make it important, you have to get the name correctly. That's what the book says. If you don't do it correctly, the first impression that's gone. So you have to talk on your name. It can be like. As you mentioned, baby and all, all the other words coming up. But when you say a word, it's a first part, an impression. And that's why it goes for the person. It can be business. It can be with your friends, family and all. It's the name. So what the author also brings a very interesting example as well. Uh, how even, you know, when you're in a conversation, as well, how the word can be more powerful, how the name can be powerful for you to emphasize something. Because when you say the name, it's more emphasizing. And I would like to bring an example is the TWA, which is a popular airline in US, how they have made it more personal. That is, that's the call, but one of the most personalized airline and most people love to go is all the uh, like staff members, crew members of the airline is remembering any person's name. So they try to call from your name when they want to serve you. So naming and personalized, and that's how they have been the competitive advantage and how they have brought that to that level. So how to make it personal, how to give, get the attention, and how to make you listen, it's the name. So spell the word name correctly and put your effort to remember the name. Some, sometimes you'll, you'll think about the scenario, it's very hard to remember the name, isn't it? So the book also says very interesting uh, part is try to resonate and relate something that is more interesting to you. If the name relates to something that is more remembering, relate to that and try to remember the name. Put your effort to remember the name and that's where you're going to get the best benefit on your conversation. Okay. Now, I am terrible with names. Uh, it's a bit embarrassing to say this on this live stream. Sometimes I had to pull my phone book and check, uh, okay, what's this person's name? Or stalk that person on Facebook and remember yeah. that person's <laughs> name. But uh, I agree with you saying the name because it brings a lot of respect uh, to that person. And that's what... Uh, kind of builds that confidence and trust with that person as well. Uh, but uh, Mr. Lord, I would like to ask you, uh, in Sri Lanka, we tend to use Aya Malli Aya uh, Nangiaka in the corporate world. Uh, we also see Sir, 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 wherever we go. And sometimes uh, people will be like, hey, call me Glenn. How, how do you see this? How does it work based on your experience? What's, what would you advise uh, to people? I, um, Sharon, I, this is a very <laughs> good question. You, you ask me at the right time. So I hate people calling me Mr. Glenn, for example. <laughs> I, I, I don't see why they have got to address someone like that. And I think first name is good enough for all of us. I think we are out of the past colonial type of uh, thinking. We are now in a new age. We're in a new, new place where we can talk first name basis. I hear people calling me Uncle Glenn, for example. Um, you know, there is someone, someone that said, do you call a first family name or the first name? First name, yeah. My, my family name is Lord. 
I hope no one will say good morning, Lord, to me. I, I would I would ask them to say good morning, Glenn, but uh, I think I would feel very awkward if they use my surname. I would always love family name. I even tell my guys in the office, look, just call me by my first name. And that makes us closer together and more understanding. So first name always is, is the key, to, is the way to go. And I think a lot of people use the term boss. Uh, boss yeah. is on the way. Boss is in a bad mood. Um, these terms that we use, that, that changes the, the work-life balance in the environment as well, brings a lot of uncertainty, disagreements. But I, I, I suppose it depends on the uh, culture of the organizations as well. Exactly. So we need to be careful. Uh, but I agree with you. I think calling a person by its name. And in the event, there were several comments that uh, was mentioned. What if we are pronouncing the name wrong? And trust me, with my surname, nobody gets it right. And I'm a very <laughs> chilled person on that subject. But uh, if ever you have to ask someone, you can say, am I pronouncing it right? In a very polite way, in a very humble and a very friendly gesture. Uh, is, is that Sharon or is it Sharon or they call me Sharona uh, in, in so many ways. But I think that's it's a very simple uh, tone that you put it out, the way you deliver and you can very politely ask them, is this all right to ask there? So we're gonna go back um, to the book, Who's in Your Room? Um, Glenn, many of us have friends on social media are they also to be considered as people in your room? I have this problem now, wherever I go, every friend who's on my Facebook is like, oh, I'm a good friend of Sharon. And then I'm in trouble thinking, I don't even know this person. <laughs> how, how do we tackle that? Good, good question. Uh, this is something that I also did not think of before I read the book. After I read the book, I realized you wouldn't imagine, Sharon, the amount of people who are listed who are in your room. All those on your Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, everyone who subscribed to your YouTube channel, they are all in your room, whether you like it or not. Remember on Facebook, they watch you, they know everything you do. Some people even post the breakfast that they have, so they know what breakfast you have. Um, so. Be careful. This is where I told you, one of my friends said, you know, you actually helped me to disconnect from some people whom I didn't actually know, but I just added them as friends. So it's, it's of no purpose. Uh, so Facebook, definitely. Uh, would you like to know the other list of people as well? In addition to all social media contacts, even the movies you watch, not just the actors and actresses, but also the characters they play. So now I ask people who loves to watch horror movies. I don't know whether we'll get a response on the chat box. Uh, who loves to watch horror movies? And you'll be amazed to see the amount of people who love to watch horror movies. Now remember that that character in the horror movie is also in your room. Okay, mm -hmm. someone says not me. Someone says not me. Not me too, Glenn. Anything for thrillers and comedy, but not... Uh... The characters but... also get into your room. But uh, the type of people who are in your room are everyone, basically. We usually connect only to friends, but it's your family members, your neighbors, whatever community you are in. Pick a book, for example, everyone is in your room, and that's a fantastic community to be with. To be with. It's a lot of positives there. Uh, members of the organizations that you join, so be careful when you join organizations, do a good study of who is there, the character or the values of the organization, see what they actually tally with your values. Um, again, movie, the movie stars, they're all in your room. So you see, um, so for example, you watch horror movies all the time, right? This thing actually rubs off on your character somewhere. You're yearning to watch another horror movie because that's what excites you. And that's dangerous. That's really dangerous when it's so, even your thinking patterns are going to change. Randula is smiling. I don't know whether Randula likes horror movies or not, but. <laughs> I love but horror I, movies. Oh, oh, wow. okay. <laughs> I, I find it difficult to connect Randula with horror movies uh, because he's actually talking about a different subject totally. Uh, but I suppose that's a hobby, but I think it's from the point of view of youngsters, especially children growing up. Uh, if you have the right values and if you tell them the right things, show them the right movies, then they will build up also a different mindset. 
But if you leave it to themselves to choose whatever they want, uh, it's going to be a different ball game altogether. So your question, social media, yes, uh, I have. I don't have time to add people into my social media. Uh, I, but whenever I do this, I have a criteria. I look at the values. I look at whether they are always about politics. Then it's a definite no-no. I look at whether they use bad words, uh, a lot of filth in their posts. Then it's a definite no-no. If they're not original and if they're not really making an impact to the people who are on their page, then uh, to me also it's of not not much interest. Uh, Please bear with me. I'm not a harsh person. I like to be a friend to everyone. I like to open my door to everyone. But I think values is very, very important. Um, yeah, so social media, definitely. So be very careful whom you connect with. And Glenn, it's your preference, isn't it? Um, because these are the people who are going to help you grow and you want to help them too. And that's what this is all about. So the exactly. kind of friends that you associate, you motivate, you, you build your little network will only survive only if you have the right amount of people around you. Um, Sachin, I'm going to come to you because uh, strangers, there are so many questions that has come. 840 is our time and we still have a lot of attendees who have uh, joined us in. Um, I'm going to quickly take through some of the areas that was given. Um, here we go. I think my computer is stuck a little. Okay, um, Sachin, if you can quickly tell me or share a few examples, what's your favorite part in the book? Okay, uh, so uh, I'll be very careful about pronouncing names here. So I'll try to skip all the Cuban names that I supposed to tell on this example because I am terrible at pronouncing Cuban names. Uh, the, the book talks about a specific CIA agent um, and that CIA agent called a mountain climber, climber, and uh, he was a junior CIA agent in, in uh, deployed in Russia by the time in the Cold War, and he was very very successful. And uh, actually, Russia got to know about this, and they they offered them billions of dollars for them for him to convert into into Russian intelligence, but he refused as a proper CIA agent and because of all this he got promoted really high on up on his ranks and got deployed to Cuba uh, because Cuba was uh, run uh, running by Cathro at that time and it was the hub which uh, was very very crucial for uh, for all the intelligence when it comes to Russia and uh, US so after that he he was the higher ranking officer in 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 uh, Cuba and he created a massive a huge network of intelligence inside Cuba with, within years. And he, because of this tremendous work he has done, he got promoted way, way up in his CIA organization itself. But after about few years, a person, a higher ranking person from Castro's team, a, a Cuban uh, intelligence person who was deployed in Europe, suddenly came into Vienna um, uh, embassy of uh, US and said, I am, I am a, I'm the lead on, on, on all the operations on Europe for Castro, and I would like to turn into US, but I will only speak to one person, and that person would be um, the mountain climber. So then he, they, he had the US had to fly him back, and then when he meets him, he asked, okay, mountain climber asked, why, why, are, you, why are you doing this? And tell me some proof to make sure that you are actually an, an, an intelligence officer and you have valuable information to us. And then he turned back and said, remember that person who you put on, on our military uh, named X, I would not pronounce the name, named X, uh, who, who, who is supposed to be sending intelligence to you and he's higher up in the Navy, remember that person? He said, yes, yes, I, I only put him, I, I vetted him myself and I only put him, yeah, right, he, he's a double agent, he's working for us. And then he, he went on and asked, okay, do you remember that person who you put next to Castro himself, where he's supposed to take pictures of Castro's letters and send them to you? Yes, I remember him as well. I only betted him, he was our best guy. Yeah, all those letters actually we wrote them in order to send to you, so he's also a double agent. So now uh, mountain climbers whole career is falling apart in, in front of him because every single person he put on Castro's uh, army, Castro's government are double agents actually. So uh, he went on and explained about 68 of such high-end um, 
operatives who were supposed to be agents of us who are actually double agents for castro himself so this created that was the ma major major embarrassing story about the cia and uh, joining that back to our our talk uh, we think that maybe mountain climate did the wrong thing no he actually did the right thing he created a proper network of intelligence but what he actually failed to do was he forgot to understand how people would behave and and that is the price that we have to pay in order to uh, live in this life he did nothing wrong but sometimes you get wrong i mean he talked about 68 people who were double agents but on the other hand there were hundreds of people who he put so it's a win win situation for both of them uh, Sachin, uh, I'm going to. We've got 15 minutes to go quickly. How can you judge a stranger if she or he or she is acting or pretending? Yes, I think I partially answered that question a little bit yeah. back as well. So, uh, if that person is pretending, of course, from the evolution or from the genetics or the or the or the facts, uh, factors we have to identify a single person will fail miserably. So, you have to keep that in your mind. It, it depends on whether you are acting or whether you are genuine, but a mismatch. So you need to be conscious about everything, but I'm sorry, I can't give you a proper answer on it because we are not wired that way. We can't understand people if they are pretending as soon as we think. We, we think that we can understand, even judges think that they can understand people and decide who is right and who is wrong. But but um, on the contrary, people think and the, and the studies say that even judges or even FBI agents, they fail miserably. They, you and I have the same ability to judge people as, as, as a very seasoned CIA official or a very seasoned uh, politician. So it, it's, we, we are all the same unless a very small fraction of people, which uh, I'm sure we none of us are a part of. Uh, thanks a lot, Sachin. Um, Glenn? Um, do you believe in second chance, uh, giving a person, let's say a person comes into your life, does something absolutely wrong, tears you apart, and then you mark your distance, but then there is a possibility that this person can change and can be the real influencer in your life. Do you think that person uh, can have like a second chance? For sure. The, uh, the book, Sharon, does not tell you anything about, see, for a the first thing is that they never get out of your life. Mm. So you have this choice of putting them into that wreck on the rear, but you also have a choice of doing something good and bringing them back. So uh, one of the examples that was given in the book was the mother, the son who was, who was actually irritated with his mother. His mother was living alone somewhere. She was aged and he was married and he was living separately. And every time he called her, she would start complaining about some friend or the other. And then uh, he was really getting annoyed with it. But being her son, obviously, he couldn't discard her. He was not going to pack her into a box and put her into the rack on the rear. He told him, he told the mother, Mom, when I call you, let's talk about you and me. At the first, the first instance, I listened to you complaining about someone don't get angry with me. I'm going to keep the phone down. Immediately, the ma her, his mother realized what she had done and her, his mother realized that she was just talking about herself and about all that was happening about herself and not really concerned about what exactly. She was not even asking the son what he was doing, how he was. So this was one of the ways. So I think it's about being open to the person and mostly family members. You need to talk to them, even your relatives, even friends. Uh, Bringing the core values in is something very, very important. Uh, I can take it from Randula that appreciation should be on top of everyone's core value. And I think that's a fantastic thing that should go on. So I think if you talk to your friends about core values, uh, sit down, discuss with them. You know, the phase of life, as you said, phases of life, one phase is over. You go into the phase of maturity and then you've got to face things in a completely different way. So you just get your people that you want to, who are closest to your heart, if you want to change them, certainly go ahead and give them a second chance. Try to see how, how you can influence them and impact their lives. Maybe they are up against a wall. Maybe they're having issues. Talk to them, be a friend to them uh, because you're in their room as well. You might as well do something good for them. 
Um, thanks a lot, Glenn. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who joined us live. How many times can a person be pardoned? Randula? Okay. <laughs> Interesting question. I actually read that and I was thinking in my mind as well. I think that would be depend per person and how and important situation. that person is to you. Yeah. yeah. The situation. How important and uh, how, how serious that person has breached that trust on you. So it, it, uh, it's very, you know, uh, very can be biased and uh, can be a uh, very challenging uh, uh, answer that I would say is it, it, can, it, it really depends on uh, how do you uh, like treat that person and also the impact of that. So it, it's up, up to you to decide. It, it, we can't tell it's one or two, like four or five likewise. It depends the impact and as well as how important that person to you, as well as think about the scenario we just want to share as well where Dale Carnegie also showed that is try to, it's the empathy. Try to see whether, why, why, why this person is coming on that. I want to highlight what Glenn also highlighted is complaining, which the mother, uh, mother and son's conversation, do not complain. Actually, when I, when I read this book, I was, I used to be a person who's complaining stuff. And after I read this book, actually, I realized complaining will not work in that way. And you don't know that, when you start complaining, other person will automatically get to know as a have a bad, build up a bad impression upon you when you start complaining. So stop complaining. That's another part. And as well as because uh, the background, how to pardon and how to treat comes with that. So it really depends on how you how you're gonna give the pardon and the, the impact. You have to evaluate the impact and how you want to keep the relationship going. So that's that's what I'm thinking. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Randula. Um, and also, uh, thank you for all the panelists for giving us that very insightful discussions. Uh, could we give a quick overview uh, to all our attendees on the book, where they can buy, and also your final thoughts on why they should read this book? Um, Glenn? Okay, so who is in your room? Is Yes, it is available locally. Someone had mentioned there in the chat box that it's, uh, where, it is, where is it available? It's available at the BNI office, but you can get it through Pickabook. So if you, if you inform your Pickabook uh, club or any member in Pickabook or even mention here, if you want the book, it is available. It is available at a very special price at uh, BNI Sri Lanka. It's at 1,900, but you cannot actually put a price on this because this book is going to change your life forever. It is going to change your life forever. It has changed mine. It has changed many people. So grab the book, get it quickly. It's a quick reader. Uh, don't, don't fail to take, we have limited copies. All right. Um, Sachin? All right. Um, Talking to Strangers is a pretty new book. Actually, it uh, came out last year. So you don't, you can't get the soft uh, cover. It actually comes in the hardcover and I recommend buying that or maybe you can try to get the kindle version of it and it's uh, it's available in any store that is and that is there and i think uh, pickabook also can get you connected to some vendor that can give it to you so to wrap up everything up uh, i would say um, talking to strangers is a really really tough scene and uh, some of us think that we are very good at it but we are not and some of us think that we are terrible at it but in the reality we might be a bit better than that but uh, to wrap things up, I think there are three things that you need to, there are three, three, three things that you need to uh, associate about uh, talking to strangers. And the first one is you don't have to be less educated to get deceived. I mean, Mountain Clyburn was the most uh, high ranking CIA official that was, and he got deceived. So you don't have to be less educated or more educated to decide whether you will get deceived or not. And the other thing is, you can get deceived more than once in the same way because we default to truth all the time. So bear that in mind. And finally, you don't have to be a genius to, to, to deceive someone. You can be very basic about what you say. You can be very basic about your pitch and still try to deceive someone in, in, a, in a very successful way because people always uh, default to truth. So. Keep, that, keep this in mind. Don't be paranoid about anyone because we can't live in a paranoid world. So that is very important to understand. You need to trust strangers. 
but you always have to keep in mind that there is a small price to pay in order to be the become uh, someone who is trusting and someone who is uh, lovable as a person. So that is basically the gist out of it. I encourage all of you to read this book. It is very interesting and uh, talks about different different uh, examples and case studies, as uh, Sharon mentioned. So yeah, it's a very interesting book to read. Thank you. Thanks, Sachin. And Randula? Yeah. So thank you, Sharon. And uh, the most important thing, the amazing thing about, thing about the book is it's not only about you start a relationship or start a discussion with a stranger. It's all about how you can maintain relationships, how you can restart a relationship. And it talks about all relationships because starting from business relationship, friends, family, and all, it talks all across. So it's a book, as I mentioned, how you want to keep up the relationships going, how to have it like more actively. So as a main summary, so you can get this book around and you can buzz me. I have uh, several copies as with me. And I want, I want to suggest even, I, we, we have done it, uh, we are starting that initiative at office is any person who joins, especially on a sales team or a business strategy team, the relationship part, you should give this book as the first step to read. If, if, if that person has gone through this book. So it's a very important book, even to start relationship, how to maintain it. And because, as I mentioned, the key three things that is the one I want to highlight is one thing is how to make yourself one thing to like is to get the ego out. You want to get the motivation. You want to make that person to talk to you. And second thing is continue that on listening. Third thing, immediately start and start the conversation with the name and as well as remember the name. That's the key thing. So it's all about, most of us think about us and we, when we start discussing, we always start about discussing about us, what we are interested in. It's a natural way. But main thing we want to importantly highlight is what that person would like to talk to us. Think in terms of that person when you start the discussion, so you're going to be more successful as well as inspiring. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you for that very valuable information. We're starting a brand new week from today. So which means we want you to be in a very positive mindset when you go to work tomorrow um, with this key takes that were shared by our fantastic panelists, determining the values, understanding who your true friends are, always being for them, not just to take stuff and then uh, kick them off the list it doesn't work like that and also questions the type of questions that you ask from a stranger be mindful with what you ask and also be a great listener uh, probably the number one thing that you can do and also draw some positive energy to that person whenever you meet people that's something that would uh, you can drive that little energy to that person and you need to be the person to do all of that. So thank you very much to Glenn, Sachin and Randula. I hope I pronounced all your names correctly. And it's <laughs> been a real so. pleasure yes. uh, to be your Today, moderator, yes. moderator as well. To all our attendees, thank you for joining us. And for more details on Pick a Book, you can join us uh, or check out their website for further details because we have a lot of webinars that's taking place from Flip's Flip flip side as well. Until we see you next time, I'm going to wind up with something that my uh, speech and spoken English teacher told me is that you be a humble and a kind person that would make a world of a difference. Uh, this was mentioned by Mrs. Daphne Lord, who is also the mother of Glenn Lord. Uh, I mean, we are here today because of the teachers who taught us or instill those great values. So I like to remind her at this very moment why we say thank you, have yourself a super Sunday and bring on the energy and smile to another person. Take care and until we see you next time. Thanks, Sharon. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, all the attendees. Thank you. Bye-bye.